Thank you. So let's start. First of all, a quick introduction about myself. I work for a company called Opposing Force. We are an Italian security company. We do offensive physical security, SCADA stuff, and ICS research. And since last year, we, were also, we are also a member of uh, smart, smart, securing smartcities.org, an initiative that is in place to help smart cities to get more secure. We did a round table yesterday. I don't know if you were present. You can find it on the YouTube channel of the Hack in the Box. So yeah, that's it. So what we are going to speak about today? So I will give a quick introduction about the engagement I will tell you about. And then I will briefly explain um, what I mean with the, this red teaming activity. And then I will tell you about how and what we did on the field and why there is SCADA involved in this and how we act the SCADA device in order to gain our final goal. And then we, you can ask questions. So let's start with the introduction. So first of all, we got hired for a red teaming mission um, from an industrial manufacturer in Italy. I'm saying red teaming because it's not a real red teaming engagement since there is no blue team on the other side. So we were actually alone. And before starting, I have to make uh, another note. So some of the technical details that I will, um, I will not speak about today now is because we are still under NDA from the company that engages us. So if you have any question about how we do something that is not explained here, you can ask, us, ask me later, maybe at the lounge in the hotel, pay me a drink, and I will be more happy to, uh, to answer that. OK. So briefly, the engagement details for, uh, for this work were we were not provide any of the uh, ad any addresses for the target, the facility target. And we had seven days to complete the engagement. We only get the, the company names that hire us. And we had full control of the scenarios that we wanted to implement in order to succeed in the attack. So we also had three rules. The first one was that we were allowed to use any uh, physical or cyber or human uh, assets. We can attack any of those assets. So we could do social engineering. We could do uh, attacking from cyber perspective, from remotely or on-site, the on-site network. Or we can do a physical intrusion. Uh, we were not allowed to do any disruptive attacks. So we could not break windows. We could not like cut through um, perimeter and stuff like this. And of course, there no harm was uh, intended against the personnel of the of the company. And there were only one simple goal. So this manufacturer produced a machine. This machine used a, a PLC in order to control it. And inside this PLC, there is a receipt, a software made by the company. And this is actually the intellectual property of the company that they want us to steal. So the, the, the goal was actually very simple. Just steal this receipt, this software, nothing else. So. What is the, what I meant with the reteaming? So it's a simulation of a advanced attack scenarios, usually driven by a goal or a multiple goals. Uh, it's not limited to only cyber domain. It can also use, as, as we saw, physical domain, human domain. And as I said, could combine any of those. Uh, in, usually is designed to, to test the maturity of a blue team. Uh, in this case, uh, as I already said, there were no blue team in the, in the company, but this is why it's not a real red team uh, engagement. And usually we use this, this type of engagement to convince the management that the security is not good enough, and so they have to do more testing, more uh, preparation for the security issue that can, they can encounter in the future. I will drink a lot, sorry. So, we saw that we could use cyber attack, we could use physical attack, we could use human, human attacks. What we did is opting for a physical intrusion approach. So let's see what we, what we have. So this is the standard flow that you usually follow, that anyone in the field usually follows to create a, um, a doable scenario for this attack. So we start with a 
OSINT, Open Source Intelligence. Then we move on on-site surveillance, so we take care understanding what is the, the security, the physical security situation of the company. And then we define multiple attack scenarios, and we try to understand which is the best one to, to follow through. And after that, we prepare for the intrusion. In our case, as we will see later, we had to do two main things. So we had to bypass an alarm and do some SCADA hacking. And then we have the real intrusion phase in which we enter in the building. And then we have to reach our goals once we are inside. So in this specific case, we identified three possible scenarios. The first one was entering and stealing the PLC uh, from the machine. The second one was entering and download the PLC data, so the software that we are, that is our goal, directly from the machine without removing the PLC from the machine itself. And finally, the third scenario was entering, placing sort of backdoor in the company network and access later the network and try to see if we can reach the, the PLC and so the, the data that we are, that is our goal. So, after the first phases, so after the OSINT phases, after the um, on-site surveillance, we decide to go with the scenario number two. But before going into details about the attack scenario, let's see quickly about the equipment that we use for the first phases. So this is what we use for usually for uh, on-site surveillance. So it's quite simple, may, may, mainly a, a camera with a good telescopic lens in order to read, to see inside the company. Usually use some SDR in order to understand if there is some type of um, wireless alarms or stuff like this in place inside the, the industry in this case. And then we sometimes use a drone for air surveillance if we have a big, uh, like a campus or something that we cannot like see through uh, from outside. And then we also need a lot of time and patience because you have to spend hours and hours just making picture and surveying the, the place. So a lot of time, a lot of patience is required. So in this case, we spent 36 hours, more or less, in doing this type of analysis, and the results were a good planimetry of the place. So the, the image is not very clear, unfortunately, because of the big screen, but uh, let me try to point the in interesting thing. So here, and here we have some sort of um, bench work, workbench, sorry, some workbench in which the machine were actually assembled and the PLC were mounted on the machine because the machine were, like the pieces were bought from China, they assembled it in Italy and then they mount the, the PLC and program it with their own software. In this area, we have some test bench in which the machine assembled were tested uh, against some sort of like specification from laws or some entity, I don't know. And then we have in this other place a sort of storage in which I think assembled machine were ready for shipped for shipping were were stored. We also have a, a small office here. I don't know what they use it for. And then we have another room that we don't know nothing about because there is no window, so we couldn't see anything from the outside. And then we have the entrance. This is this corridor here with a, a couple of doors. And here and there we have some stuff laying around, we really don't know much about that. So this is what we found from, from the outside. As I said, we used the camera to take picture from of the inside, and we have this, this uh, quite clear picture of what we are going to expect from the intrusion. So we also found that the factory has a, an alarm system and the control panel is placed in the entrance. So. The entrance is here, the control panel was right here. So we could take a good picture of the control panel from the outside because of the windows right on the, in the opposite side. So unluckily, the pin code of the, to disable the alarm is, was not possible to, to be saw from the outside because the people were right in front of the control panel when they were inputting in the pin. So this is something that we could not, done, okay, we could not do. Uh, as you can see, this is one of the pictures that we took from the outside. You can see that is actually the alarm is off because it's uh, work time. And so we had to find another way to bypass the alarm. So during the surveillance, we also map all the uh, infrared sensor that we could see inside the, the factory. 
And after that, we decide to buy the same alarm model in order to find some vulnerability in the firmware or in the communication between the control panel and the sensor. We also found that, I forgot to mention in the slide, that the, the sensor were communicating with the control panel wirelessly. So there can be multiple vulnerability, as you already know, and so we decide to buy the same model and see if we can find something. So I don't know if you can see, this is a picture with the, no, it's too small, sorry. This is a picture with the map of the sensor. So there are one here, one on the opposite side, one in this angle, one in the other angle, and then there are one, two in this room, one in the main office, and one in the, in the entrance. This one has a limit around here, so after the control panel, of course. So when we, buy, when we bought the, the, the alarm system that they use, we found that they have an anti-jamming feature that has a little small bag that they allows a 15 second timeout before the alarm start, uh, start the sound. So we can jam this, the, the communication between the sensor and the control system, uh, the control panel for 15 seconds before the alarm starts. Uh, moreover, we also found out that the infrared sensor, the range of infrared sensor were not big enough to cover the entire area. So using this information and working in our lab, we found out that more or less this is the situation, okay? So you can see the red circle is the range of the sensor that I showed you before. So as you can clearly see, there is like this corridor here that is not covered by the sensor. So our first idea was, okay, we can lock pick this window, enter inside, and can, we can do whatever we want. No, because these windows has no locks from the outside. The only lock is from the inside. So we could not lock, unlock this uh, window and get inside, and we cannot break it because, as I said before, we cannot do any disruptive method to, to get the goal. So the only way to get inside is through the main door. Uh, luckily for us, the second door, this one, is, was usually left open because of convenience, I think. So what, what is the plan? The plan to get inside was to uh, lock pick the first door, this one, get here, start jamming the, se the sensor, run until the middle of the, of the other room, because luckily the other door was open, and then in, if you can do that in less than 15 seconds, then we stop the jamming, the alarms start working again, and we are already there. We can work on the machine. And then we can jam it again to exit. Okay, that was the plan for the actual intrusion. But at this point, we have still to figure out how to get the data from the PLC we decided that we don't want to steal the machine because the machine was actually pretty big. Uh, you probably cannot see the, the scale, but the, this side is like 25 meters or something like that. So the machine is around two meters per two, so quite, quite big to bring outside, and also it will trigger the sensor. It's quite impossible to do that in less than 15 seconds. So we decided to go with uh, hacking the PLC in order to try to find a way to get the data. And as we did for the alarm, we both the same uh, PLC that they were using. And we, f sorry. And we found out that there is a, a download and upload feature in the PLC that can be protected by a user-defined passcode. Uh, it's a passcode that the user have to provide to the software before downloading a PLC, uh, sorry, a receipt from the PLC, and that you usually have to also to, to input during the upload from the computer to the PLC. Of course, if you forget the password, you have to reset the memory of the PLC before you can like reset the password. The passcode is a only four digits code, so initially we thought, uh, okay, we can brute force it. Uh, no, because after five failed attempts, we have a 30 minutes uh, timeout lock on the PLC. That means that we can try in real time 0.16 passcode pass per minute. So it will require too much time. So we started analyzing the Modbus traffic between the PLC and the computer that communicate with it. And we found out that there is a sort of magic packet that the PC sends to the PLC to reset the fail attempt counter. So after what we did is uh, we create a new receipt by our own, 
we upload it to the PLC and we start to analyze how the communication when we upload and download a receipt with the PLC works. And of course, with a known passcode because we set the passcode in this case. So what we found out is that we have this magic packet that allows us to reset, reset the counter. So we could actually reset the counter before the timeout um, goes in place. Moreover, we also found out that the passcode verification is done client side. So it's the PC that's that communicates with the PLC is the actual that control that the passcode that you have inputted in the PLC is actually the same one that is stored in the PLC. So that means that somehow the PC have to read, the software on the PC have to read the passcode from the PLC. So there is a way for the PC to read the, the passcode from the memory of the PLC. And after further investigation, we found out that we can send custom commands, custom Modbus commands to the PLC in order to read and write arbitrary address on the memory. So that explains also this magic packet, packet that I mentioned before that could allow us to reset the counter to zero. It's just an address in the memory that take care of how many failed attempts you have made to the input of the, P the passcode. We can just reset it or we can easily read the memory address in which the passcode is stored and then use the same passcode to download the PLC. Actually, the PLC software. Actually, since we have this command, we don't really need the passcode. We can just read the PLC memory and extract the software that we, that we are looking for. The only thing is that we need to properly map the memory where the software is mapping the memory. That was the, the main thing, the main problem that we, that we saw when we found out this thing, because we had also a, a very straight time constraint for the, for the engagement. So a quick, uh, a quick details, technical details about this packet. So maybe some of you already know what is Modbus, Modbus ASCII. It's a version of Modbus that use only ASCII uh, charts during the communication. So it make it easy for debugging purposes and for us to read the communication. So the packet in, uh, in our case is slightly modified Modbus uh, ASCII protocol. We have the same uh, starting chart, the semicolon, then we have the device address because we can have multiple PLC on the same device or on the same bus. Then we have the Modbus command, in this case 03. Then we have the payload for this Modbus command, a checksum and the ending chart. So in our case, the command is 03, as I said, and 03 in the Modbus uh, protocol means read a holding register. This Modbus command usually has a um, four byte uh, payload. In our case, this is slightly modified, it's a five byte payload, and it's not reading a holding register, it's reading an address in the memory. So the first four bytes is the memory address that we want to read, and then we pass as fifth byte of the payload the number of bytes that we want to read. So in this case, we can read from this offset for 40 bytes and the, the PLC will return us the data. Actually, I think I didn't modify, this is the address for the password. So, yeah, it's supposed to be a feature for the software that uses these, these kind of commands to get the bug information from the PLC, and in our case, also the password for the on-site, uh, for the um, local verification of the PIN code. That's not it. I mean, okay, we can retrieve the password, but the, another interesting thing is that the password is stored in clear text. So not only we can retrieve it, but we can also actually read it immediately because there is no encryption. There is only a, a small encoding I will show you later. So to recap, at this point what we have is uh, we can read the data from the memory, from the device address, we can write on the device address, so we can change the pin code to like provide a sort of denial of service attacks against a normal user that doesn't know about this functionality. And uh, as I said, the passcode is only encoded, so it's not encrypted. The encoding mechanism is something weird, is this one. So for any X char, they have a correspondent um, X value, and sometimes is the ASCII value of the, of the char, sometimes it's not. I don't know why, but multiple tests show that this encoding table is uh, the correct one. So to summarize, now we have a way to enter in the, in, the, in, the, in the building. We have a way 
to download the receipt uh, that is our goal, and we have a way to get out. So we put everything together, we create a small exploit uh, for this. As I said before, we, this is the flow of the exploit. As I said before, we, couldn't, we could bypass this first part, because actually we don't need the passcode to download the receipt, we could just read the memory. But as I said, is diff was the time constraint didn't allow us to map the, the receipt in the memory. So we didn't know exactly where the receipt was in the memory and if this receipt was encoded in some way. So for respecting the timeline, we use the same software that the vendor provides with just the pin code that we can retrieve using our exploit. So we use the exploit, we retrieve the passcode, we try to decode it, we, we pass this passcode to the, um, to the software, the software will download the receipt. So after that, we do the intrusion, we succeed. Yeah. Okay, so I like this picture. Question. Non-technical question. <laughs> Uh, I, it was clear for me how did you get in, okay. um, how did you get out? You, same you way. did the same way, like yeah. you jump the signal? You jump, after we get the, 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 the PLC software, we jump the same, the, same, the same way and we use the same way to get through the same path of before. So we use the open door and we reach the second door, which is we were left open because we already lockpicked it and then we get out. And uh, when you send the the sign, like the commands for the password, right? Mm -hmm. That you, how did you do that through the? They has a keyboard, the PLC, or you no, connected we, some cable? What or? we did is um, we use a Raspberry Pi with all the software inside. We connect the Raspberry Pi through Ethernet to the to the PLC. The PLC has an Ethernet port. I forgot to mention. Um, so the, the Raspberry Pi will automatically, there is a Python script inside that will automatically, on the power up, will automatically send the, the, the correct byte, uh, the correct packet to the, to the PLC, retrieve the passcode, launch the software, and, and save on the memory the, the software of the PLC. You're welcome. Uh, hi, uh, nice talk. Um, what, what about the timing? Did you during the night, weekends? Like there was a special moment where you get in oh, and okay. out? Yeah. Or, so for the, the people in the room, I don't know if it were workers. No. Uh, so what we what you usually do in the surveillance part for most of our engagement is to uh, try to understand the behavior during normal work day and also during the weekend. So the thirty six hour that I sp I spoke to you before we're not uh, like continuously. We spend like 12 hours during a normal Monday and then like 24 hours during the weekend. So we have a clear idea if there is like external surveillance or if there is external companies that provide surveillance and at what time the people usually come to see if everything is okay and this stuff. So what we did at the end of the, at the, end of the day is uh, in the intrusion part, the, the actual intrusion was done on the, week, on the weekend during um, daylight, because there, were, there is no surveillance during daylight. We could get in quite easily because the, lo the locks were shitty locks. And, uh, and then after that, we act normally. And all, 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 all the intrusion part is done in like five minutes. Because the software will download the, 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 the receipt in 30 seconds. The only thing was jam it, be sure that the, the, the sensor were jammed. After we, we got sure that it did work, we jam it again and then get in. And question, how did you get the model of the PLC? Did you get it with a camera from yeah. the outside? Yes. Oh, okay. Because far away, right? Let me get back to the to the map. Okay. So if you see this is uh, our targets. So we targeted this device that was on this test bench. Uh, you can see that from this window and from this window you have a clear C of the, the, of the machines. And from these windows you can also see the PLC inside. And since we got quite good lens for this kind of work, we could identify the, the brand and also the model of the PLC because it was printed on the, on the, main, on the main case of the PLC itself. So yeah, this is all part of the first few phases. So the, on, the OSINT, the remote, uh, information analysis and the on-site surveillance. Questions? 
Yeah. And, and did you give also some security recommendations at the end, like how to improve it, or it was not part of the job? Um, in this case, the recommendation that we gave them was to change the PLC. <laughs> and we didn't do yet the full disclosure to the PLC manufacturer because of this NDA. So we need to wait until the NDA expired to, can, to communicate the vulnerabilities to the, to the vendor, and they will probably don't want to fix it because it's, as I said, from the, from the meme, they consider it a feature because the software they, they ship use this feature to do the bugging, info, to get the bugging information, to get uh, the passcode and this kind. They also had to rewrite the whole software. So in my opinion, they, and from my experience, they probably won't fix it, but we'll do the communication some months later. Part, like the sensors, mobility, like did you recommend something about the doors? Oh, yes, about the yes. Uh, in this case, what we, what we recommend is another alarm system that uh, had, first of all, uh, a, a fewer timeout for the jamming feature, and moreover, it also has some, uh, some of the sensors were cabled, and some of the sensors were wireless, so there is a bit of redundancy. And they, we also recommend to install sensor on the windows because we didn't break the windows, but the windows had no sensor and no alarm sensor on it. So a real attacker can easily break the window, enter inside the, the building, and, and, and do the same thing. Moreover, the new sensor were also placed on, on the ceiling instead of on the walls, so they could cover the whole area more easily. The, the range was bigger, of course, and this kind of stuff. Okay, so. Non technical question. Uh, yes. The facility didn't have any CCTV cameras or. Sorry, can you repeat? The facility didn't have any CCTV cameras for monitoring. Or on the matter? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. They actually, uh, they actually use our recommendation for. Oh, yeah, they, they, they implement our recommendation in the following weeks. Uh, they still haven't replaced all the PLC because of production issues that you have to buy it, you have to test it, you have to modify some part of the code because it's a different PLC, blah, 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 but they are taking care of it, yeah, strangely. <laughs> okay? Okay, so thank you, Matthew. Thank so you. if you have any further questions, you can talk to Matthew anytime. <laughs>